there's probably been many different moments in my life that my life changed, but the most dramatic one recently was a year ago, my house burned down in the Woolsey fire. And in that moment, I was possessionless and um, homeless. I had to transition from being homeless, possessionless, <laughs> and then jobless um, to figure out how do I want to live the next year. And I decided to um, buy a Sprinter van and make my lifestyle so that I could be on the road professionally. And I hit the road and explored. And what I've learned from that is how to be more connected to who I am and actually dropped into how to, how to really be happy in the state of loss. I'm Dr. Larry Bruchette, and as I see every day in the ER, life can change in a moment. On this show, we tell the stories that matter most, after which we are never the same. We've got a great guest for you today, Kim Wyman, dietitian. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Larry. Now, you are more than a dietitian. Yes. You are a registered dietitian. I am a registered, registered dietitian, and I have my master's in public health nutrition, but I mostly work with the acuity of eating disorders and the relationship to food there. So it's kind of a where the deconstruction around one's ability to meet their needs has happened. And so it's kind of bringing them back to being able to do that. Whoa. You put a lot. <laughs> I feel like we should take that like one <laughs> phrase at a time. So you're a registered dietitian. Yeah. You have an MPH. Yeah, it's ma miles per hour. No, I'm joking. It's it's <laughs> Masters of Public Health. Why'd you get Why'd you get an MPH? What Why? In, yeah, what interested you? To? Um, I was pre med, and I did all my pre med, and I was in finishing college, and I was really interested in preventative medicine. And my uh, counselor at the time was like, mm, "That's not really what you're going to be dealing with if you go the MD route." And so he had a doctorate in public health. And mm -hmm. I was like, you should really explore that. So I had to have all my pre-meds for that anyway. And I never, I think to be a doctor, you have to always have had that focus to want to be a doctor. And I had literally kind of gone through college doing my pre-meds because, you know, just in case I wanted to do that, <laughs> doing humanities, English. Just in case. Just in case. I was very, I was Keep very, I had, I had philosophy, religion in there, you know. So um, I showed up for graduate school on the doctor route towards public health, and I had to pick a major, so I picked nutrition. And I was so you interested. Got, wait a minute, you got the MPH before the RD? Yes. How did that work? So what happens is with the with the masters of nutrition, you get the RD with that. So so I didn't get it as an undergrad. I got it as a as a masters. I'm confused. You have an MPH, a masters in public health, and you have a masters in nutrition. Well, Are those two it's, separate it's things? a separate. So, I mean, it's a concentration. So within public health, you could be, um, you could do women's and children's health. You could do I nutrition. See. You could do hospital administration. You could kind do. like a specialty. Yeah. You said a concentration within. Yeah. So, it, so I had to pick one and I just have to pick nutrition. And then because you have to do so much, it pretty much qualifies as an undergraduate RD. So they, they did a little extra, then took the boards, got the RD with it because it's, it's kind of more of a functional degree, the RD part. I don't think I've, I've, I haven't really ever heard of an MPH RD yeah. like this. Well, yeah, there's probably a lot of RDs out there that have an MPH or an MS. They do either an MS or a master's. A master's. Yeah. So. And then that whole thing you said, which I'm going to buckle into eating disorders, mm -hmm. but you said... Say that stuff again. That was what so, I was like trying to slow you down <laughs> so and with, unpack that a little bit. A lot bit. of times with, with nutrition, people think of, you know, if, if I'm at a party and I say I'm a dietitian, people are like, oh, tell me what to eat or I'm trying this new diet or this or that. Can you tell me about the keto? Can you tell me about the intermittent fasting? Can you tell me about that? And I, I can, it's actually kind of a boring conversation to me to talk about all that, to be honest, because um, what, what really fundamentally matters is you can... You can know a lot about nutrition, like I could know all about, you know, biochemistry and you can know everything about the keto diet, or you can know everything about whatever. There's a lot of nutrition knowledge to be had out there, okay. but it is, 
the applied action and relationship to how you meet your needs with it that matters. So if you have a breakdown in how you're able to meet your needs, like you say you don't deserve, you don't believe you deserve, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a really hard time integrating care. And how you feed yourself is a direct basic need and it is a direct action of care. So it gets into a lot of emotional stuff. So disorders around food are usually disorders of self or you know where people are struggling S with psychology yeah it's a in, in, in eating disorders are a psychiatric qualification yeah. so the dsm that way so i happened to <laughs> in the same way i was doing college in the same way i was doing graduate school i was always just kind of let's see where i land here <laughs> and so i landed in west hollywood um, in a gym right on La Cienega post-grad school and I should have you know I should have like tried to get a normal job like in the hospital or something but I ended up just taking over this private practice of this other dietitian driving into to LA from Loma Linda and had not a dime to my name but I I was I just started working with the LGBT community and at that time it was in the, the late 90s okay the cocktail was just coming in with HIV. So most of my clientele um, were gay men. and who With had, HIV? With HIV, HIV had AIDS. lost partners, had lost friends. You know, it was right at the time when things started improving. But, you know, the 80s had happened, the late 90s. I mean, it was really hard. Um, so a lot of trauma, a lot of loss. And people were dying. And, and yeah, and then there was also just the the extreme body dysmorphia and body image stuff that, that was in that population. So basically, bless them, they kind of like really started not teaching me in the sense that I didn't have any experience of it myself, but just highlighting that relational piece with, with the food. So... Um, dealing with loss and regulating emotionally with food that way or um, just the whole pressure of you know what they looked like you know and so I mean that's just a small segment of the of cult of, of our culture but it it was just kind of a, a amplification of what was out there you highlighted know? those issues so um, so I that's kind of and then I thought I was going to specialize with HIV because <laughs> that was kind of the thing so I was dealing a lot with like you know, having to keep weight on, having to, you know, so it was more medical. But anyway, I started, you know. So wait a minute, but but I, but I think I want to ask you a question. Yeah. So, uh, give me an example. You kind of blew through and said uh, HIV uh, patients who had gone through loss, mm -hmm. and then I don't remember what you said about how they met their needs. Give me an example. So what, to, what happens, I know what that means, but. What happens with, with an eating disorder primarily is that food becomes a way to regulate disruption and whether that's to regulate emotion emotion how state yeah it's emotional whether to regulate um their environment a person's environment sometimes like um like if you think about it a kid who's who's not having their needs met at home maybe they have an alcoholic parent for example and that parent's coming in very inconsistent so they don't have this consistency of having their needs met so there's there's this inconsistent dynamic that they start to amp that they start to actually match within themselves but also they may not be you know dinner might not be on the table consistently either and so they might start eating food or hiding food or you know to feel better from that emotional neglect almost or... they you know food tastes good and it actually affects the brain in a certain way and so kids learn immediately that that's something that they can resource within themselves to feel better that they can create that consistency. So it, it can start that way, or it could be, you know, there's so many ways it comes through, but um, it could be a young athlete or, you know, the teachers, or it, 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 there's so many ways that kids get a message about self that they feel that they have to try to make it better, or they're trying to, um, you know, in, just from a very baseline feel better, <laughs> feel more loved or feel more safe or feel more whatever so that there's a regulate so, yeah so that so that so the food can regulate things so it can translate you know a typical you know description might be that a person's trying to 
regulate control of their environment. If there's, if they might have some inconsistency, they don't feel safe, or they're, or there's very, it's temperamental. So uh, anorexia, quali you know, typically if you look at someone with anorexia, they're usually incredibly talented, driven, very functional, and they're just, and they might, you know, be the envy of everybody else in the room. But behind the scenes, they're driving themselves almost to death with how restrictive they are with the food or going to the gym or walking, you know, 12 hours at night by themselves in the dark streets, extreme. you know, totally extreme. So what happens is they go to regulate a need and it, it's kind of ass over tit. It, it starts to take over. <laughs> so the the dis show? Oh my God. <laughs> Edit that. <laughs> no, the, the 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 thing about it is, it starts with an element of of trying to control. It could start with someone just going on a diet, and if that temperament is there, it could shift into that. And I mean, there's so many people that I've am counseling after you know, 12, 20 years of their eating disorder that started out with them just wanting to try to lose weight. So that's why sometimes that diet conversation can get a little tricky because. Um, Sometimes that information is like handing, you know, putting guns in someone's, I mean, putting bullets in someone's gun. So yeah. it's like loading it. So you don't know all the time who that person is, what they're dealing with. That's why it's an emotional piece. And, and you have to understand what that person's relationship is to their needs. And if it's from a place of truly wanting to nurture themselves and love themselves, um, that's ultimately the, the goal with like nurturing and, and feeding yourself because it, food's great, food's amazing. I mean, I'm a chef, I love cooking. I love cooking for my friends. I love having dinner parties. And um, I don't like to um, have a lot of limits on <laughs> like I can't eat that, can't eat that, blah, blah, blah. Restriction. It's, yeah, it's just like how I, how I feel and how it's integrated in my own experiences is, is really the ultimate ability to um, nurture and really sustain like and ultimately nourish yourself so it's a very it's less external and it's more internal but that sometimes takes a long time to get to so but in dealing with some eating disorder you're dealing with someone who's that relationship is su super broken down and they're oftentimes near death i mean so the sometimes the acuity i work with is often you know they're they're phobic of food at this point they can't feed themselves or they can't feed themselves without purging it or you know, they could, they could be um, not, and, and, and if you look at basic needs, so if you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. you have like food, um, hydration, shelter, environment, shelter, like um, movement. If you look at someone with an eating disorder, and it, on top of that top triangle is like self-actualization, self-esteem, all that stuff. Everybody's trying to get that. Everybody wants to feel good about themselves, everybody wants to love themselves. But interestingly enough, the foundation of that is your basic relationship to physical needs. If you look at someone with an eating disorder, there's a disruption almost in every single one. So whether it's with elimination, yeah, so look, mean? elimination, sometimes they're, um, I mean, you look at laxative abuse, all of that. Um, you look at movement, there's complete disruption there. They're either totally not moving or absolutely just killing themselves with the stress of it. Um, and then you have the food and then isolation often with loving touch and everything. There's, there's a lot of isolation that's attached to it. Um, and then, you know, so it's, it's almost like there's this, this, um, magical thinking that I can get away with not like, I'll be okay. If, I'll, I'll be fine if I don't eat, but everybody else needs to, <laughs> or I can, you know, so there's a, there's a, there's a real disruption in all of it. So then that affects everything that comes beyond so, that. So I, I, I find this, um, deeper emotional side to food and mm -hmm, source mm -hmm. it's incredibly interesting the doctor side of me is like and and i think the challenge is how do we reconcile meeting our needs and so forth mm -hmm. enjoying food all of that mm -hmm. with obesity and excess and all of the medical problems that come yeah. with all of this and, and what's the message yeah i mean how do you if, reconcile if you those? if you if you look at obesity for example i mean you can still look at it from, look at that person's life. And a lot of times in our medical culture, we don't have a lot of time to explore this part. It's either, it's like, look at the labs, look at the weight, look at that and go, okay, you need to reduce your food. I mean, it seems like a pretty easy, direct fix, right? Sure. 
but on the surface on the surface but typically if you're looking at the environment of that person the stress level of that person um, and in in our culture more specifically looking at the socioeconomic situation and you know food accessibility and food deserts and all these I mean there's so many things that contribute to specifically diabetes and heart disease I mean I mean, as far as the numbers go across the country, um, and this if you, is the and public if you health look kind of at it, yeah, if you look at the big public health picture, then it's you're looking at a, a problem that a lot of it has to do with, um, and if if you think of food as a regulatory piece, if you're trying to work two jobs and you're super stressed and you haven't really eaten consistently all day. I mean, you get home and, I mean, there's all kinds of ways it can come in and be very poor. Um, but I think that if you look at the upper socioeconomic, you're looking at just overall stress. Um, there's also, so then you look at your endocrine system and how that kind of gets blown from stress and then just a person's ability to regulate um, their their body size, but when you say stress, you mean people get stressed at the end of the day. You eat, you yeah, feel I mean, relaxed. Yeah, I mean, stressed across the board. I mean, there's so much. Um, I mean, I think our our culture doesn't know how to really nurture. And I guess this 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 will kind of go into my life changing moment when we talk Your about moment. that. Moment, but. Um, the idea that of how driven we are and how everything and I mean I could talk there's so many there's so many pieces that affect a person's um, when I mean if someone comes to me and wants to lose weight specifically or get in better shape I mean of course there's there's a, a typical approach you would take but then I have to be really careful with like what else is happening and what's going on so um, I mean Honestly, if I've worked with an actor who needs to get ready for a role and they're just, it's just business, you know, they, it's, you know, you're not going to go their bodies, their business. When Tom Cruise is like, I yeah. want to get cut for Mission Impossible. <laughs> I actually had to get it ready for Mission Impossible. I know. That's why I brought that up. We talked about this oh, before. I thought, how did you know that? Anyway, but no, Let's but just it, say. he was a, it was a <laughs> business deal. Like he was probably the most driven, he is the most driven person. And so, um, and and I th I find this with a lot of actors specifically it's their job yeah. and it's and they are almost this corporation in and of itself so they do exactly what they need to do now they I have execute. worked with ones yeah. that are suffering horribly from an eating disorder too yeah. but there's a really strong edge and I couldn't actually get them to surrender and get help because of the pressure of the other that was going on. So it goes both ways, but Tom Cruise did not have an eating disorder. Um, so he, it, just to clarify, Tom, I know what, this has what? been years, so I know whatever agreement I signed with that was working <laughs> But this was a long time ago. Um, so, so, but it's like, so yes, there's a way to approach like how to get more fit or how to do whatever. Well, so, so, but I, so let me ask you about that. I know we want to get deeper too. Yeah. What is that approach? What is um, a healthy approach to getting more fit I, that minimizes the risk of developing an eating disorder or feeling bad about yourself yeah, from approaching I mean, that goal? It, it's really, um, if you look at nurturing as, as a way to, if, if you look at someone who's cared for, there's a certain result, right? I mean, if... If, if somebody who has their needs met to begin yeah, with, if they're, then does. they're cared for. And then you have a genetic set point and all that stuff. So yeah. there's, there's a way to be in relationship with having permission to have satisfaction, having permission to feel um, a connection to the food you're eating. And it's, okay. it's also, you could go into the connection to the earth, to how it's grown. I mean, there is a real basic truth to the fact that that the more from the ground cared for food is going to be better in our system than something that's highly processed and sure. really that's the intention is not care <laughs> the intention is mass production mass production profit, profit feeling like you know having things so so as far as just i don't think we have an unavailability to high 
quality, good food if you're in a certain socioeconomic class. I mean, we're getting back to farm to table, which is kind of weird that we're calling it like this new thing, but we went away from farm to table. Like we used to be a farm to table all the time. Mm -hmm. Like that, that was how we did it. And then did you ever see, you watched Mad Men, I'm sure. I've seen Mad Men. Okay. Well, it, there's an interesting, there's interesting little blips in Mad Men that kind of show the food culture of the time. Mm. And processed food became a socioeconomic status thing at first. You were rich enough to buy Yeah, the so the frozen stuff. meals, the, the, um. the, the TV dinners was more women's lib. You know, there's a couple scenes in um. Mad Men where they're, the women are having their cocktail, smoking cigarette, and it's like the TV dinner is on the table and it's they a new thing it's it's and they so, didn't have to do that I yeah think. so it was less work it was more so and then a lot of a lot of times when people come like from um more third world cultures it's almost it is also a socioeconomic status to have something like the donuts and the things that are because it's it means that's what it means to money. it's so so we had we had kind of this 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 whole progression into a, a different culture with food and then it started making a difference. I mean, there's this is a very long conversation actually about like how things kind of um, started getting maneuvered culturally with our relationship to food. But cut to now, I mean, we're getting back to understanding that you know things grown from the ground and as less process as possible and. And, and people are like love cooking shows and that's just been a huge, the Food Network has been a huge thing because it is counter to the stress that we have in our, our lives. So actually- Stress cook, is a big yeah, enemy you're identifying Cooking in this. a meal and have, taking the time to do that and nurturing yourself and having that relationship fundamentally will, will be experienced different in the body than you know, running in your car and eating a, you know, McDonald's hamburger on the way to somewhere else, you know, um, that's just how you're gonna receive it. it if, if you look at, you know, cultures in Europe and the French would be like completely appalled that we, you, they wouldn't have a meal in their car. I mean, the are you, cultural differences yeah. between. So taking the time and like and actually letting your body be nourished and actually um, allowing that to be something to be honored and appreciated and all that, that's, that's a different reflection towards self. So a lot of self-care is taking the time and knowing what we deserve and, and feeling good. So feeling good <laughs> would, is, is an indicator that you haven't stressed yourself. So um, you know, eating too much actually doesn't feel good. It, you have to disconnect from your natural body state and to, it feels bad. There's a, there's a natural, I don't feel good anymore. And so afterwards, like afterwards, maybe 30 minutes when yeah. you're eating yeah, but there's a the point. Taco Bell taco. It's yeah. like, God, this is so good more. <laughs> and then like, it's about 10 minutes and you're yeah. like, Oh, I yeah. shouldn't have done that. But right. it was great for 10 but minutes. It, but, and then you can really assess how good did it feel? Like you know what I mean? there's a difference in, so it's slowing everything down, not only in how you're, you're preparing the food or how you're eating it, but slowing it down so that you actually stay connected to the experience. There's so much dis disconnection from everything with intimacy, with everything in our culture. And that relationship to care is an intimate relationship to self. And there's so much disconnection now. We don't have that correlation between internally feeling what we're doing and it and it and it translates to movement too like um if you look at the blue zones do you know what the blue zone studies are of the areas yeah the, blue areas, zones where are the areas where you have the 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 highest longevity right? highest longevity where you have centurions that are actually healthy so there's a, a the highest population of people over 100 that are actually well that are moving around living their lives and there's the the commonality and this is on the movement piece, nobody in those blue zones exercises to exercise extremely. They don't go to the gym. It's not these people all do 60, 90 minutes of cardio every day, blah, blah, blah. These people were social, they gardened, they walked, they lived. They didn't do, they're, they're, they didn't do that. So that's, again, if you pull stress into the factor, that's a de-stressing system. So movement is super necessary and being active is really necessary. 
Um, but how we do it is also important. And again, we've disconnected how we do it. I mean, I know that going to the gym is such a key thing and being on a treadmill is convenient, but you're running going nowhere. Like you're, you know, like you're, I mean, there, there's a, there's a rat race kind of feeling to that, you know? So, and you're looking at the clock and you're looking at how much you've done and it's not enjoyable necessarily. You might as opposed to being out and doing, doing, as doing as it socially, going, going and, on a walk, yeah, playing, playing a calling sport. Calling a friend, going on a hike, doing a run, whatever. I mean, the way I like to incorporate exercise um, in the same way I like to incorporate food, but um, essentially I'll do movement to help it so that the sport or the play that I like to do is not hard. And especially as I'm going to be 50, like it's like I want to, <laughs> I want to be moving and, and climbing mountains and all that stuff for many more years. And if I'm not, especially yoga, if I'm not doing yoga or something like that, it, I start to feel the, you know, the natural, like, lack of Aches elasticity and and, yeah, yeah. that happens. So movement is very necessary for feeling good. Again, feeling good is, 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 is something to, a nice thing to achieve. Um, but but when, you're, when you're doing it, you know, and it could be daily. I, I recommend it daily. I, I think you should be taking that time for yourself daily, but I don't, I'm not saying you have to do, there's no specific specific exercise. I'm saying you have to do this and you have to do blah, blah, blah. I know I, I, I can't do it that way, but so, so movement and, and your relationship to the food, being able to, um, actually connect to the experience of all of it is really what is going to elicit vitality and wellness. And, you know, but you can also do it you know, you can be a gym rat and be on a diet and <laughs> also look great and your labs will look great when you go see your doctor. Like, it's not a matter of, it's not a matter of you can't do it and be healthy. That's not, but are you as happy? Maybe. I don't know. You, so you've identified some main enemies. Stress is one of them. Disconnection is another. Yeah. Talking about the blue zones and people that don't exercise, like, this set aside yeah. time where they're just kind of generally active and they move mm -hmm. in their lives. We had a um, Bill Barada. What was he? Ninety eight. Had a ninety eight year old guy on the show. Oh, nice. And he never exercised. He was a farmer. Yeah, exactly. And he was active in his daily life. Yeah. Act lived in ninety eight. Activity is important. He was in great shape at ninety eight. I was like, mm -hmm. what was your secret? And he didn't have any crazy diet. He just no. ate in moderation and overeat. Yeah. Had a beer every now and again, you know, like didn't yeah. smoke or abuse drugs. There's actually so. thunder outside. Did you just hear that? Is that thunder? That was thunder. In Los Angeles? In Los Angeles. It sounded like a trash can. No. It's, there's a storm. There's a storm moving in. I thought it was thunder as well. Whatever. The anyway, guy, whatever. The, he didn't do whatever and he lived to 98. Yeah. Let me do this. But he was also probably had, so here's something really, just really quick. So on the, on the, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have the self-actualization, right? In the, I think it was in the 70s when Maslow died, people are like, what the F is self-actualization? <laughs> like, what is that exactly? What does that actually mean? What does mean? that mean? And so people So, so the started, Maslow's thing, for, and you explained it just for the people at yeah. home, it's a pyramid. It. Yeah. And on the bottom is basic needs. Basic and I think the idea needs. is like you can't get to the next level of achievement or whatever until you really meet your basic needs yeah. of food, shelter, whatever on the bottom. And then the second rung is what? Career I, or money yeah, or so I can't even and you go up and it's social, them. whatever. And then the top one you're referring the to, which is like and then self actualization. The self actualization yeah. is just like what? You're Gandhi so, or you're just So this, understanding the farmer that's ninety eight. Um, Self-actualization is when you're in the flow, where you're really doing like it's like so. There's parts of your brain that activate that when you're in this state. Like when they looked at the brain of a musician that's composing music, more parts of the brain were activating than they really thought possible. Like we can't multitask very well, mm -hmm. so typically we can't do certain things together. But when you're in the flow of something, all of a sudden, it's almost like time, time and everything kind of, if you're really into something, wow. it, 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 you lose time almost, and you're in the flow of something. I mean, you could be 
a, an artist, a musician, but you could also be, they use an example of a fishmonger in New York who, who slices his fish exactly the same way as his dad, his I grandfather, see. but it was something that was so much a part of him and he could do it all day long and in his, and that was his flow. So it doesn't have to be that you're creating some masterpiece of art, but that was his masterpiece. So being a farmer, doing his task, doing his daily thing, I mean, you're, you're doing something and that is probably the, the antecedent to stress because you're activating all the, the connections. antidote. Itself. Yes, the, an antidote to stress. So to so combat getting to lower that and state, counter yeah. stress. So that that does speak to, you know, stress distracts from our connection to self, and it distracts from that ability to be in the flow. So when you're feeding yourself, you, and when, when you you're say moving, stress, what do you mean by stress? I mean we have all kinds of stress. We have we have personal stress, relational stress. Disconnection. I think that this, our culture of disconnection is stressful. Um, it's. I mean, there's environmental stress. There's. So it's. It's. How do you choose to? How do you choose to live your life? I mean, um, having children, having family, having relationships. All of it's an aspect of stress. Source of but stress. But it's. It's. And then it's. It's in a, a person's ability to how how they perceive it. So, I can talk about stress and how one goes through it based on, and we talk about my story, but um, with the moment, but. What is your moment? Oh, the moment. What um, is your story? Do you want to pause before we get into it or? No. <laughs> Are you okay? You want to keep going? Yeah. I think we keep going. <laughs> so. We'll roll. Um, if we need a break, we'll do it. So I would say that um, what I've, my, the life changing moments, this is, what's the exact topic? Yeah, life can change in a life moment. Life can exactly. change in a moment. So that, I mean, there's probably been many different moments in my life that my life changed, but the most dramatic one recently was a year ago, my house burned down in the Woolsey fire. And in that moment, I was possessionless and um, homeless all in one go. I mean, everything that, I mean, the house was gone. So, and everything in it. I got out with my dog and a little to-go bag, basically, because I thought, oh, I'll be coming back when we have to really evacuate, because I left just before um, the fires were what do you, what do you, very directed in our area. What, what, do you, what, was, what do you remember? When was the first like, moment where you're like, oh, there's a fire? Well, <gasps> I was at, I, so I, work at a treat, I worked at a treatment center, that there, the residential treatment center, so it's a house, and it's like literally like a mile and a half from where my house was. So I was actually at work, and I was sitting in treatment team with all the other therapists and clinicians, and I looked outside, and, it, and there, we had this wind vane that just, it was almost like time kind of stopped for a minute, and it looked like something wicked this way comes kind of moment. I just had this feeling, and the wind was crazy that day. And oh. I just saw the wind, and I was like, oh, that's not good. And being in that area, I live right against the Malibu Creek State Park. I live in a little, I lived in a little 1920s wooden gable little post and beam cottage. Mm -hmm. I have always been a little bit nervous about the wind because of the risk of fire. And here in California with the Santa Anas, it's not, it's, it's, it's actually like dealing with hurricanes. It's not just a breezy day. It's, it's gale force, 70 mile an hour, 80 mile an hour winds that would be qualified and you know we don't have rain with it we have hot dry air and that creates these firestorms so it's never a good situation in you know october november when that starts and then we have um we had a, a person that worked with the search and rescue that he always would check in on the house and with the clients and stuff and and he called us and said oh there's a fire but it's way far away and this was like way on the other side of the 101 at this point I don't know how many miles, but it was 20, 30 miles on the other side of a seven lane mm. concrete freeway. So he's like, you don't worry about it, but you know, it's, it's the winds coming, you know, it was tracking towards where we were and where I lived. Um, well, he, he did kind of give us a little bit of postings throughout the day. And finally he said, you know, have the girls pack a bag just in case they have to evacuate just in case. And he's like, cause if it crosses the one-on-one, you guys are going to have to run. So I went, well, I live right down the street. I met her. Go pack a bag too. But then I got home and I was like, 
whatever. It's going to be fine. <laughs> I made myself. I would have said the same thing. I literally thing. made myself a greyhound because I had these fresh grapefruit in the house <laughs> and I was like having a cocktail at home. And my sister, I have a twin sister, and she calls me, and and she says, "Kim, I heard there's fire." And I, and she's like, "It's are you going to be okay?" I was like, "Oh, it's fine." I said, "It, it's going to be fine." I said, "It's it's going to move west." I said, "There's no way it's going to hit here," and she and she's much more anxious than I am. She's like, "I'm not going to sleep tonight if you don't leave," and I went, "Oh, great, you." That's probably true. Like she wasn't gonna sleep. I knew it. Like she would. She said that she's like, get Luca and go to Devin Paul's. And it was a friend of mine. And so I was like, really? It's nine o'clock. <laughs> okay. So I thought I'll I'll come back tomorrow. And uh, um, I left and I got there to their house. And two other people, friends of ours from Oak Park, which is just north of us, they came. <clears throat> they came evacuated to, to the same house. But they smelled like smoke. They had been running from the fire. And I went, oh, wow. So we were focused all night on watching the news and seeing if their house had burned down. You know, so all night. And then finally, you I You weren't just, thinking about yours. Mm-hmm. You were about I theirs. just went to bed at like 3 in the morning, woke up, turned on the TV, and I got a call from one of my colleagues from work. And I found out he had crossed the 101. <clears throat> so that means up at the 101. And basically... From and the one on one over it, it's just it's just you know it's state park, state land. There's a lot of it's just all full, it's all fuel. So then I was watching on the news my workplace them fending the fire off that, and it was and I still thought oh maybe it'll go. <laughs> it'll go so your time. house hadn't burned down at that not point. yet, but it, and they were fending off the fire by work. But this was literally a mile and a half from my house, up at a corner. Well, it wasn't until they did a shot with this. And watching the news was extremely frustrating that day, I will say, because, you know, they're doing media, news coverage and it's not really specifically, I, I realized in that moment, like I wanted them to tell me where they were exactly, where the traction was, give me more maps, give me something, but it wasn't that. I was like, so all day I was just like, I'm finding something. Did you Finally, do like a Google map thing? Yeah, I Satellite? tried. It was so work? frustrating because it was so all over the place. Um, I mean, my sister was from Idaho, was like, giving me some information that was new information and telling me where it was in Malibu and all this stuff. But anyway, finally channel two was, had this, uh, had a shot where this m- big house was burning. I knew exactly which house it was. It was on top of the hill and Malibu Lake is this little hamlet in the mountains and it's got a lake and there's houses all around and it's, and it looks like, I mean, it's, it just looks like somewhere else. It doesn't look like LA. It's a really, really beautiful place. But up on top of this hill, <laughs> it pans across all of Malibu Lake. And my house is way over here on the corner. And it looked like freaking Armageddon. I mean, the place was just blowing up. And when it panned over to where my house, all I could see were those big, like, tornado, like, fire tornadoes. And I just went, no, 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 no. And so that's when I finally, like, let it drop. And then my friend, my neighbor actually called me probably five hours after that. And he had, um, he had snuck back in because they weren't letting anybody in. And he just called me. He's like, it's all gone, Kim. It's all gone. I said, what? What do you mean? What do you mean? All gone. He's like, no, none of our houses are here. Our whole street's gone. <laughs> and I just went. Then I was like, oh, oh my Your God. Your house had burned down Everything's in that fire. Gone. Yeah. So, and then, the, and then the process started of like, what do you do after that? <sighs> so, and the, and the other thing that was affected was with my place of business was also affected. So they were shut down. So I was... I, I, I had a, I had a house that I loved to entertain and I would bring people there. It was had really like people just felt cared for there. It was, and I had just done a bunch of renovation about three years prior. So it was, it was very much an identity. Like that was part of me, like it was part of an extension of, mm. of me. So it was just, a. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, it, it was, I, I can't really explain the feeling, but it was complete recalibration. So going through the initial grieving, I had, luckily I had places to land. I mean, I, so many people didn't have anywhere to go. And I, I just stayed at the house that I, my friends just were like, oh no, yeah, you're staying in the bedroom. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. But it was, luckily I had my car and my dog. Those are two things I had to still stay mobile. But what really what really changed was a game changer was how i chose to live this last year and um it i was 
I had we had a family trip that had been planned for Thanksgiving that year um, to for, to celebrate my brother-in-law's 50th, and they're sitting with me in Kauai, and I'm and a couple of rental situations had just not panned out, and I'm having to pay mortgage, and I'm trying to find rent in LA. It's just not a fun situation to try to think of like where am I going to live, where am I going to land, how am I going to do this? Why are you paying a mortgage? Because you still have to pay a mortgage. Even though your Even house, though burned, house down? burns down. <laughs> yeah. What? This is the bank. The bank still wants their money. So oh, I, does it, wouldn't that be covered in an insurance policy? That is. I mean, sense you to could me. use your insurance money to pay off the mortgage, but then you really wouldn't have a house. So what I'm uh, doing? It's crazy to me that you're you, still paying a you, mortgage. <laughs> paying a mortgage the entire time. So on the ashes and the on, land. On I the guess. land. You're paying yeah. a mortgage on the land yeah, and whatever. But burned it's down. just a little steep for the land but um anyway my sister and and it was really hard for me because 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 of how much attachment i had to my space and how much you know just the energy was there it was really hard to think of living in an apartment somewhere after having a home and yeah and anyway so i was trying to find something that would fit it wasn't coming through and um i was sitting in uh on a deck in this house in Kauai and just kind of in tears. And my sister's like, Kim, why don't you live in a van? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, a van? <laughs> you know, a van? I can't live in a van. <laughs> like, she's, like, what are you talking about? And so she's like, wait, just wait, just let me show you something. And so she shows me this Instagram site, it's 40 Hours of Freedom. And it was this beautiful, like super cute, couple with this super cute tricked out insta, insta famous super van cute. so cute and i was like oh, well i could live in that van that van's pretty cute i could totally live in that van and i was Not like the how, homeless VW how do you yeah you're imagining. <laughs> like down by the river um but you you i was like well how would i do that you just drive her i could i say what i wrote of her so i called them and and i asked them if they did build outs and they did and so then i emailed them told them my story and they called me back and they're like, yeah, it's like six months out before we could even start a build out. And then it's another three months, four months after that. And I just went, mm. I need a house now. And he's like, well, we haven't announced this, but we're pregnant. And we just wanted to know if you wanted to buy our van because we're going to move our shop to Boise. And so the very van that I said, oh, I could live in that van, <laughs> was the van they offered to sell it, me. It worked out. I was like, yes, I will buy your van. So I used the insurance money that I, they give you some money for rent um, if you have that in your policy. And I was lucky enough to have some. So I used um, that money, all of it, and then some to, to buy the van. So I quit my job because that's a whole other part of the story with just the stress and what was happening with the company and and all these things and i i became homeless <laughs> jobless and had a van and i hit the road a year and that's ago. what i've been doing a year but what i did do is i also i know of a there's a practice in denver she she does she's probably the best eating disorder medical practice concierge medicine in the country and um, i called her and I said, I need referrals and I'm going to start doing telemedicine. So I've been doing mm. teletherapy, telemedicine with clients all over the world, all over the West Coast, really, in Canada, all year. Um, and that's how I've been working. But I have been, I've hit, I've totally changed my life. I mean, I've traveled all over the, I mean, I've climbed mountains. I've seen things I just wouldn't have had access to. I've um, minimized everything in my life to where, you know, I've been wearing the same clothes for a year now. <laughs> my small little closet full of clothes. Um, but I've done things that, you know, what, I, what my experience is meeting people is that everybody's like, oh, I want to do that. I want to, I want to, that's my retirement plan. Or mm -hmm. that's, I mean, a lot of like millennials or that's their first home plan and so i've realized that there's this whole culture of like van life and people wanting to do that but van but i think there that the appeal of it for so many people is that it simplifies everything it simplifies you know when we talk about stress and we talk about 
um, you know, emotionally trying to, to just kind of connect. I mean, you have to, you just drop in. The, the amount of times I'm just silent with myself and alone, you know, in a, on a mountain or somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and I've had to be in that stillness. And if you look at any Buddhist practice of, you know, Zen mind, it's, it's, it's almost just how you get there. So I've gone from worrying about a lot of the corporate stuff that I would worry about or, you know, I was worried about how I was going to fix my house too, like continue the renovations. I was worried about almost kind of like the keeping up with the Joneses, Joneses kind of thing. And now I... I don't think about really any of it. I, I am no re rebuild. I am rebuilding. You are, but I the, the, even the approach that I have with that is that it's going to be okay because what you experience, and this is really I think spiritually what people are faced with if in, when there's a life changing moment, it's how how do you want to experience? How do you choose to experience it? And you can get really stuck in the cycle of loss and the perception of loss and how it's happened to you versus how it's happened for you. And every time there's something that you lose, every time that something is taken away, whether it's, it's having a child and losing your freedom or um, you know, getting married and losing your freedom, whatever it is, there's any time you, you, you go through a, a, inviting more, there's, you have to let something else go. And so loss is just like a massive um, spiritual game changer if you want to be available to know how to receive. So it's, it's how you let that be in your life. And so when people say, I'm so sorry your house burned down, or I'm so sorry, it, it doesn't feel like I'm so sorry anymore. It doesn't feel like that at all. It feels like it's been a really great year, you that, know. That was the beginning. Yeah, it was. It was almost like rebirth um, on so many levels, and and I had wanted to travel more, and I had wanted to climb more mountains, and I had wanted to. I mean, I, I went. I mean, I have ski up every time I go snowboarding now because I just drive my van up to the. <laughs> so it's like there's so many things I just have accessibility to do things I loved and even you know even cooking from the road and learning how you know figuring that out and finding the little places along the way the little places that people still have a lot of connection to the food and you know I've just I love talking to some of the you know stories I went to, to New Mexico and into Taos and I've had some just crazy experiences. I mean, connecting to connecting to our culture as a whole, but also finding the variances of it, and and um, being able to to feel more of an intimate connection to people and to places and to the food and to what the environment is, and also um, not having to take a you know vacation yet. <laughs> I've been working the entire time too, <laughs> even though I've been on vacation. People think I'm on vacation all the time. It's because I only work two days a week now, just so you know. So you work two days a week now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I'll work more when I need to, but you don't have to work. I as don't much, right? have to work as much, and not that I don't still have like all the bills and stuff. I've just like minimized that. It's just not as important to. It's not as important to have since much you money. went through this. Yeah. Um, did did I have so many questions? Okay, well fire away. What did you What did you lose? Um, St so just on one level, stuff like okay, well, your house burned down. The, the, the thing, I mean, I lost all of my possessions and all of the, all of what I had put into the house. But the major thing that it was the hardest part was when my mom died, my dad pretty much gutted their house because he just didn't want any of it. And all of my grandmother's stuff, all of my great grandmother's stuff, all of my mom's stuff, all of their wedding china, all of the stuff that I used kind of on a daily basis and entertained with and just things that are the things that were the last connection as far as a material thing to my mom were all in my house. <laughs> so my sister was grieving that too. But that that's when I'm just like, why didn't I just grab those two things that as a kid I told grandma that I wanted, you know, um, just stupid stuff. But it's, it, and it, and it still, it, it still is just, it's still at the end of the day, just stuff. And it's what we attach to it. The significance so of what it means, it's, yeah. It's, it's sad not to have some of those things. And it's not like I had some 
cachet of like some major heirlooms and stuff. It was just, it was just the little things, like all the little spoons my grandmother had connect, collected in Europe and the ones that, you the know, mementos just or... little things that, that yeah. I had actually started. I, and luckily, like the year before, whatever I had, because I entertained a lot and there was all this silver and all this like China, like all this stuff that a lot of people just keep stashed away. And I had started just pulling it out, using it, making all these great little cheese boards and stuff with it. So, so it was fun. And so I, I miss that. I miss, well, I miss having a kitchen right now, but, um, but losing, um, I, I won't, I, I don't feel like besides that, that, I lost anything in a, from a, in a negative way. Computers. I mean, everything. Photos. Everything. Everything. You, of, of, besides kind of the family heirloom and significance, other things that were really, that were harder to I lose? I mean, I was really bummed I didn't grab my snowboard bag. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it was a bag. I could have thrown it in my car. Why did I ask all my winter stuff in? Well, so, the, like, here's the other question. like... Yeah. Your house is on fire. You can grab one, a yeah. few things. Like, I mean, would you I, have grabbed that stuff? I would have grabbed my. I probably would knew. have left exactly how I did because my house was a tinderbox, and there was been no time. I always knew that if 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 a fire came, I had to run. So I probably would have done exactly what I did and grabbed my dog and gone. So. But if I had to, I, I could have put some things in my car. Like, yes, of course, I would have put the photo albums in. Or I, would have, yeah. I would have put the, because, again, the pictures of my mom, and, and she's not around, and I didn't have a lot. Um, there were just a few things that I would say. But, but at the end of the day, unless you have a to-go bag, unless you have all your stuff or you have it all set to go, it's hard to think about what is important. And then it kind of comes down to there's not much that really is. <laughs> I mean, I, I had my theme. passport in my purse, which was nice because it wasn't a hassle because I was traveling very soon after that. But, um, but other than that, I mean, really, it's, it's, um, it's your life and your dog. Anything with a heartbeat you want to get out. That's crazy. That's so crazy <laughs> that that happened. And you, it like, kind of, you never would have chosen this path, right? This kind of pushed yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, then that's, I think that's the thing when you, when you realize that, you know, as we're on our path, that everything really is happening for us. And, and sometimes things feel really painful and tragic and are experienced that way and truly are that. But at the same time, it's how do we... It, it's what more of ourselves emerges from that experience. And, and I feel more safe, more at peace, um, happier, really. Not that I wasn't really pretty happy to begin with, but I mean, I, it, I have more connection. Um, I have less worry, <laughs> oddly enough, um, than I did a year ago. But a lot of it is because I've been in my lifestyle of, of, of the travels I've done and um, really the, the sheer beauty I have seen. I mean, we have a beautiful, I've spent most of the time on the West Coast and into Canada, um, and I, I'm gonna go more. Play, I mean, I wanna go back, and there's, I, I'm thinking of even shipping the van to Europe and doing a European trip, because I still have a year probably. Shipping the van to mm -hmm. Europe? How, wait a minute, a year? How long is it it's, gonna take I haven't even broken ground yet. Like, I'm still probably looking at another year before I have a house. So, have you back on the show in a year? Yeah. <laughs> See Where goes. have you been? Did you Where ship it to I Europe? Where's How's Aldo? your house? <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I'll go to Europe. And, you know, being truly, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny. Like, I, you know, just looking at socially, I mean, I've, I've, stayed connected with the friends I have, but I, I haven't dated this year, whatever. And before that, you know, you're like on Bumble doing stuff. That's like a whole job in and of itself, right? Trying to date at my age and, and all that stuff, but I totally let that go too. And it's, you know, you, you find a certain balance of, of like real connection to yourself and that's your resource. And not that I won't date and won't, you know, I, I see that evolving, but the way I did things just, I was able to let go of on all, on all fronts. Globally, the way everything. I worked, the everything way changed. I, yeah, the way I, I took care of myself really. Um, 
So anyway, it's, it, it's really fun. You talked about grieving not only the loss of some stuff, some heirlooms, your home, your, you know, the way you liked, the part of yourself mm -hmm. that hosted people and cooked and nurtured, I think was a word you used. How did you grieve? How did you grieve? What did that um, feel like? Here you are now, a year later, and it's kind of this triumphant, yeah. now I'm detached, my life is better, I don't, you know, I've gotten over the stuff, but that must I mean, have been hard. I, I would say the first two, the first month or two, I mean, well, the day after the fires, we weren't supposed to go, but I went back to the house. and. The, the thing that was hard, I guess this would be the other aspect of loss, it, I lived right up, and I, I mean, I still will, but I live right up against Malibu Creek State Park, and it's like a really, really beautiful part of the Santa Monica Mountains. The other place I would live almost daily would be at the beach, so Point Doom, Westwood Beach, all that area, hiking all the way through there. The fires took everything. They didn't just take my house, they took my whole world. Mm. So the park was gone. The, all the way down the beach was black. It was black as far oh. as you could see. So my whole environment looked like Armageddon. Wow. And that probably, and then I, I, I went to the house and saw, I mean, it was still smoking. Everything was, the trees were still, I mean, everything was still smoking. But I, would, I walked through the park and I saw like birds falling with their wings off and like dead animals. Oh. And, and I just was, having to I was just and, and and I lived my life kind of like Snow White with the little rabbits and the little birds chirping over and the little deer running around I mean that's how my house was like it was like I would have I'd have mountain lions and you know going to the heat like in my front yard in the middle of the night sometimes and bobcats literally so I just was like where did all the animals go like I just didn't like it just felt like so much loss and so yeah. much grief and I think I mean and I had birds that would come every year and nest and sing these specific songs, and, and I'd call it the, the spring chorus. You know, every so I had these these the the environment of which I lived was very much connected to it, and it was all gone too. Um, just my whole my whole lifestyle. How long did you live there? I'd lived there since two thousand and five. 2004. Like so it was a good chunk of time. Fourteen years. Yeah. Thirteen years. So and I you know had. I mean, I'd been through a lot in my life in that space. So anyway, the, the loss of everything that was familiar and routine for me, and that's, that's, I mean, getting in a van and going somewhere, you're just breaking your routine. Like you're leaving the routine, you're leaving what you're familiar with. And that, um, that in a way helped because being in the area, it, it, felt, it felt so devastating to see it at first I mean because it is a really beautiful space and um but I grieving was letting it out of my body I mean I cried and I I I really grieved in fact at one point the friend I was staying with and she's like she was like so is the most supportive person and just has my back but she and she wanted to she was just like it's okay Kim you know it's all right you can and I just stopped her I'm like I need to cry right now. <laughs> it's like the animals are dead, and I don't. It's just like losing it. So I mean, I I had to like I definitely went into that space, but I also found that you know part of grief is moving through grief. You can't you can't really stay in it because it it's not productive after a minute. Like it's. It's super productive to, to move with that energy and to let that move through your body, but it has to be kind of like a wave that will come in, crash, and then it dissipates out. And it might come in, crash again, but eventually the set, the set leaves and you, you, can, you can kind of ride it out. But I did find it a little bit difficult to come back into the community and be around because we had these wonderful events that happened and there's so much, there was so much great generosity and support, especially for a particular area where I lived and it was a trailer, it was a Seminole Springs was a trailer house complex and they lost all of the whole community. And there was so much like real generosity to people who really, didn't, I mean, many of them wouldn't have had insurance and they just lost everything. So I'd be in these, you know, gatherings and, and, and it was a really lovely thing as is the support, but there was also 
so much anger and so much grief and so much that it was hard for me to be in the same space too much with everybody else. It was really collaborative and there was a camaraderie about because so many people lost at the same time that there was an element of support to it. But then after a while, it got to be like, okay, I need to, I need to get on with this. And I don't feel the same way right now. And so I've got to move my life forward. Um, But I think that there was pro there. And I I do think just even recently um, in doing some of the emotional work I've been doing, I've had to let more go. Like, because you kind of go into shock and you just let it. What are you letting go now? Um, I think just layers of, of, of the loss, but at the same time, um, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of letting most of it go and moving through process that. continues, yeah. but it, it does show itself every once in a while. Um, I'm, you know, and, and living in a van is, you know, your Instagram version of it looks really super fun and cute. and. You know, we, we can go to my Instagram and see all the beautiful pictures I've been in. The van looks great. What is your Instagram? I do want to oh, check that our, out. Oh, our dot soul dot ingredients. Our soul ingredients. Our soul ingredients yeah. with dots in between. Yeah. Them. Our soul ingredients. And um, and I did it thinking I'm an, I, and, and I'm, I'm wanting to do more, but I'm wanting to pull more, more of the food life into it. And so that's, that's the name. But, um, and I will. Um, and I do have some of it there, but I've dropped off a little bit in, in my postings because um, I've been back here for a while and I actually had a little grandson born. So I'm a grandma. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm not truly a grandma. I mean, I donated my eggs. I have these genetic children. And so my genetic daughter had a grandson. I'm not the official mom. but Is that grandma denial? No, that's just, it's just a modern family version of being a grandma because <laughs> there's another grandma and a parent. I'm not the one. <laughs> anyway. Congratulations so anyway, to whatever But extent. three weeks ago, like <laughs> that, that little human was born and I was able to just go be there. Whereas, you know, last year I went to Maine to go be there for that whole you experience. Have freedom and mobility. Yeah, I have freedom now. to be with people I love, to be with events that are important, to actually connect in that way too. So there's a lot, th- a lot of things that you can take advantage of. However, you know, it gets a little tiring living in a van too. I mean, tell me about this van. What kind of van is it? What's it's the... a Mercedes Sprinter, and it's fully converted. Okay. By Alex and Sarah James, who their website, Forty Hours Freedom, they do build outs, and their vans are so I, pretty. I'm thinking of no offense, an mm-hmm. RV or a bullet. Like, how big is it? It's what kind twenty-one of... feet long. Okay. And it's good it's, size. Yeah. And it's, I have a full, you know, bed, king size bed, really. It's a little oh, bit wow. over a queen. And I pretty much have that set up all the time. And then I have a bath, and I mean, a shower and a toilet and, oh, wow. and a sink and a stove. Like, what do you need? <laughs> like, you have all you need. Yeah. And then I have a car, <laughs> all in one. I actually ended up selling and my car. Is it like parked down the street? Uh-huh. Oh, I totally want to check it out. I literally was working here all day because I, I wish we would have done. I had to come I totally park done here because I had clients right up at the. Center. Oh, I totally <laughs> should have done a thing earlier with light. Um, it's okay. I have lots of pictures. So, are, I'm I'm curious. You're so you're living in your van now, and there's a lot of advantages to this life. When your house is built, are you going to return to it? Um, I. I am less attached to having to be here full time now, which is in, which is the other thing that changed. So I'm thinking I could be here six months of the year, rent it out the other half. So you're going to stick with van life and some house life. A version life. of it, yeah. Because yeah. it's really fun to be elsewhere and, you know, catch the season somewhere. You know, I, I loved, loved, loved Canada. I thought I could go there and live there, but I can't. I can only go there for six months at a time. So maybe some, well, maybe somehow both. Yeah. So I could possibly rent, but I mean, I'm, I'm very, I, I, I really love the creative aspect of the design and stuff because I'd done some renovations. So I'm, I'm really enjoying starting from scratch and designing my house with my architect, and we have plans and. 
it's got, I've gotten through most of the hurdles. Whether I have enough money to finish it, I'm not sure. We'll so work with insurance for the and best. stuff. You have an insurance policy and they basically give you what they think the house is They worth. give you X so, and then you build. Right, and, yeah. but they, they, I had upped my premiums fairly good um, because I had done some renovation and I started to panic when I did that, thinking, oh my gosh, I'll never replace this. Um, but unfortunately, my insurance company hasn't come back with the full maximums yet. That, and so I, I'm trying to fight for a little bit for, for what I paid for, basically. Yeah. So What they owe you. So that's been a little bit of a hassle. Tell, me, tell me a minute how you... I know we're... We're, we're really... We're running out of card space, too. How much do we have? Like five minutes. Okay. Oh, I don't want to stop. We can wrap it up. I don't want to wrap it up. Um, talk to me for a minute about how you transitioned your work to where now you have, it sounds like you have a, um, kind of a mobile. So I, I essentially do like more th like therapy. So it's, I do it, I have a, a practice site and you can do video conferencing, video calls, um, FaceTime, and then it's kind of all set up. And um, a lot of the clients that I have um, and I haven't done a lot of like marketing and my website's not up yet and all that, but, um, to, to be determined at some point. Um, but they're used to doing, I think teletherapy, telemedicine is something that's transitioning in, in most therapy, in a lot of therapy fields and even with medicine, um, because it's easier for clients too, because they don't have to drive to go to an appointment. So how have you liked switching from a building or office-based practice to this? Um, the only thing that I, and I still can do it when I'm in town or whatever, but I used to do a lot of cooking with clients. And so that I, I would, I have to figure out how to do, I, whether that looks like setting up retreats somewhere and, you, like you know, that. having more destination stop, spots like that. Yeah. So I have a lot of, of things I could creatively work out but just to pay the bills and to get things going this last year transitioning to just doing the telemedicine has been really great you talk about the emotional side of food and you do not sound like an MPH or a dietitian you sound like a psychologist yeah. where did that come from um, you don't have psychology I didn't have a psychology background training. I, but when I you know when I said I was floundering around trying to figure out what I wanted to do all through college. I was, I was studying humanities, I was doing philosophy of religion, philosophy, and I had a dad who was a pastor, he was also just a philosopher of sorts, and would do counseling. I, it, it, dealing with people and their emotional states, I just can kind of thin slice things pretty easily with people, kind of a person's like how what they're doing with food usually tells me what they know about themselves or feel about themselves. So um, it's just something that came very naturally and I can't think of it in any other way. I can't separate out that emotional connection to self and how someone's taking care of themselves. It just there's they're not separate. Basically our spiritual, emotional, physical bodies are just not separate. Everything kind of, I mean, everything integrates. So with our culture of medicine and, and historically, you know, even with religion, everything kind of got parceled out. Mm. So religion took its share, psychiatry took its share, medicine took its share. And so what is happening... It's kind of turf or territory. Yeah, so what is happening with more of the integration of self in all those aspects is the same thing that's happening with our food. You know, it's getting back to bringing everything to the center and really understanding that it's all connected. Like how we grow our food affects how we ingest and how our food nurtures us. I mean, there's everything's connected. Let me, let me ask you one more question because we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of, uh, one of the demographics that I'm very interested in mm -hmm. is men who are old enough to where they have to start thinking about their health and mm -hmm. what they eat mm -hmm. and they want to be in shape. Mm -hmm. What would, how, what would you advise those guys in, holistically in terms of well, <clears throat> eating, nurturing you, you yourself, and being in shape? I kind of want to think that there's this natural, and, and I, I would say that women getting older too have to deal with menopause, and I just had to deal with that. So that's a whole other topic conversation too with how the body changes, whether you like it or not. Like it's not 
I mean the whole aging process. So, so I think, you know, there's a there's a difference between really being well and healthy versus looking a certain way. And if you want to look a certain way after 50, you have to be a little bit more specific about things because we're not naturally going to be looking like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be more of a job. So it, you have to take it. It 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 takes out of that scope of of just you know that can be okay being, there's yeah, trade-offs I mean, so there's, more there's, a, there's an aspect but i think if you're you know naturally active and and you're still playing like play is like the most important thing about movement to me and you're enjoying your food and you're enjoying your life and you're enjoying your late rela- relationships you're having sex still you're still doing all the f- really physically engaging connected things your body is going to be it, it's going to be brilliant and it's going to be exactly what it's supposed to be but it might, you might not have a six pack. <laughs> if you want the six pack, then there's other things that you have to do, but that's like a what? choice. I mean, that's when you get into the real specifics with like having to eat only certain things and you know, stripping things out and being crazy about it. You do have to be a little crazy about it. Intense. Mm-hmm. It's, it's okay. And, and, and that's totally a choice. You could be very mentally, physically, sound and, and balanced and happy doing that but it's just a choice you're not I mean I think relate, people relate people that get back, relate that back to you know I mean there's muscular dis, dysmorphia with men and oh yeah all of this kind of stuff too I feel like it's I mean there's a gray area that every there's a spectrum you know um relate it back to what specifically to men specifically well, you, right now you're saying you know it's a choice and you have yeah. to do more intense stuff but then like going back to the conversation at the beginning about nurturing yes. and where eating disorders some people um, are are have enough self-awareness and enough self-love that they can play around with doing things more specifically and it's not from a place of fear like if I don't look this way, then I'm not going to be cared for and loved. So when it's when it starts to take that tone, if it's out of fear, then you're getting into like, why are you doing that? So it becomes emotional. You could be really balanced and just really think it's just a hoot to go to the gym for three hours, <laughs> you know, or not eat carbs for, you know, but you might not hate yourself and you might not be doing it out of fear, but you might be just doing it because that's what you, that which makes you feel better. So I, I can't, I really don't, I can't hold judgment about a person's feeling and relationship to it because I think, it's I think integrating that and being well is, is is simply your own um, version of of what makes you feel good, and it it, it isn't everybody's, you know. So sure. I do think that as we get older, though, we, there is a natural aging to our bodies that if we want to still, you know, look and maybe feel a certain way, then you do have to take a little bit more. You have to pay a little bit more attention. Like I said, I do yoga because I ache if I don't at this point. You know what I mean? And being in the van, I haven't done as much yoga, and I ache more. <laughs> like, you know, it's like I've noticed that. So, so there's, 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 there's choices that you make, but I think you can make from, it's either from a place of love or from a place of fear. And I think that just, it's how you take care of yourself. Is it from that place, or is it from a fear-driven culture that you have to look a certain way to be accepted and loved? You know, that's when it gets a little bit into the emotional spectrum. So, um, I do think that you must pay attention and have consideration and a real connection to yourself in order to have a really um, vital experience in your body and, and be well. It, it's, it takes those things. So it's how you tune into that, I suppose. But This was so good. Okay. Well, thank you, Larry. Thanks for coming and talking to us. <laughs> You're welcome. You want to take it on, take it on home? People can, okay. fi- people can find you at, say your Instagram again. Um, Our Soul Ingredients. And Our Kim- Soul Kimberly Ingredients. Kimberly Wyman is on that. Kimberly Wyman. And you d- you said your website is not up. So um, are there other places the people can find you? Table. Yeah, it's not up yet. That's, that's pretty much Instagram. Instagram. Okay. I have a Facebook too, but it's not really. Kimberly Wyman. More, like with friends and stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. This was amazing. Will you close us out? Look in that camera and... Uh, Okay. So long. Farewell.
I hate to say it too. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. Uh, subscribe on Apple Podcasts and the YouTube channel. If you have a moment or you know someone that does, reach out to me, Dr. Larry Bruchette at gmail.com. And social media wise, take a screenshot of a moment of this that you liked, tag me in it, post it. Maybe I'll repost it if I see your thing. We'll see you next time. When I realized I wanted to be alone for a year, I was probably around seven. Um, and maybe for more than one year when I read uh, uh, Alone, appropriately named by Admiral Byrd about his time in the Antarctic.